Wow. Such a befitting song. To have a focus on someone else. I believe that song, along with today's message, is very fitting uh, for this week. Because this week, we need you. Not that we don't need you any other week, but this week, we, Darksville, United, need you. We need you on Wednesday at 630. We want you to bring your two cents, your four cents, your 10 cents. Just bring your cents. We need your input. Because after all, we cannot plan without you. A few people cannot justly create a calendar for the year. We need you. And I pray that after today's message, it may help you in recognizing how much we need you. Today's message is entitled, um, Anointed to Lead. And we're going to read all of 3 John, which is 14 verses. And then we'll talk about it for a few minutes. Is that all right? It doesn't matter because I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> the scripture reads as follows. The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prosper. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy uh, than to hear that my children walk in truth. Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom, if thou bring forward on their journey after godly sort, thou shalt do well, because that for his name's sake they went forth, taking nothing of the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers of the truth. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. <clears throat> Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbidden them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. Demetrius hath good report of all men, and of the truth itself. Yea, and we also bear record, and you know that our record is true. I had many things to write, but I will not write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto thee. But I trust I shall shortly see thee, and we shall speak face to face. Peace be to thee. Our friends salute thee. Greet the friends by name. Will you pray with me, please? Unto thee, O oh Lord, do we lift up our souls. We're grateful that you allowed us to gather around your table to feast from your word. Help us to eat and digest 
nutrients for our souls that we may go forth in strength and power and to accomplish your will. This we do ask in the mighty name of Jesus we do pray with thanksgiving and the church said, and it is so. Ooh. I want to digress for just a minute because there's a part, there's a, a verse in our text that um, I've been itching to talk about, even though eh, it's really not where we are today. It's verse two, it says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. Just, just remember those words for a little bit later. Um, let's first talk about Diotrephes. Diotrephes is the pastor. He has been chosen by the apostles to lead this body of believers. Um, he received his instruction, his teaching, his tutelage uh, from the apostles. And like every uh, new ministry, it, it began small, uh, humble beginnings. Over time, it, it grew. It, 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 in this era of the church, it wasn't uncommon for churches to blow up overnight. Uh, to go from a faithful few to the faithful many. Because the gospel was preached. And the, the power of the gospel leads all unto salvation. Diotrephes, um, he had a very arrogant nasty attitude and disposition. His actions would be that of one filled with hubris in nature. He arrived at a place in his own mind that he believed that he was greater than the apostles. The student believed that he was greater than the teacher. He began correctly. He did all the right things. He, he taught the right stuff. But somewhere down the line, he allowed pride and arrogance to override his character. I'm sure we really cannot attest to that today when we look at our leaders especially in the church. There's no way that we have leadership in the church who display these uh, tendencies of arrogance and, 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 and everything is centered around them. I, I know that none of you understand that. Uh, you've never had that experience, I'm sure. Um, but just in case, let's talk about it, right? And so... Diotrephes, he, he began to allow what would be deemed as the success of ministry to get to his head. The church began to grow and, and, and he had a great following with him. And somewhere down the line, he thought it was all him. He thought it was all about him. So much so that when the apostles would write to the church, he made it clear that under no uncertain terms are, is anyone to entertain the apostles. As a matter of fact, as the Bible pointed out, as this text reads for us, those who did acquiesce the apostles, uh, they were dealt with. They were put out the church. So here it is. We have a leader who believed that he was the authority of who can come in 
and who he can put out. He believed that he was justified in how he managed the house of God. Interestingly, again, I, I want to emphasize the very ones that put him in the position, or as we would say today, installed him as a pastor, are the ones he's rejecting. Those men who sat at the feet of Jesus, journeyed with him, stood shoulder to shoulder with the Lord who were witnesses, direct witnesses of miracles being performed. Diotrephe says, I no longer receive your teachings and you are no longer welcome here. One of the key tenets of our faith, and, and, and we can attest to this because whenever we go to other churches, we examine how we're received in that place. We can pretty much gauge the love that they have. We, 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 we measure the kindness that we receive. That word and, and how we do all of this is called hospitality. We look to see how hospitable the church is. Diotrephes threw hospitality out the window. You see, he believed that hospitality was selective, that he was able to choose when to be hospitable and when not to be. To put it another way, he decided when to love and when not to love when to care and when not to care. As the apostle wrote this letter addressing the, some concerns, he mentioned Diotrephes' disposition toward the apostles. But he also pointed out the actions of one who rose to the occasion and just began to do what he believed to be right and just. And that is Demetrius. Demetrius took the teachings to heart. He received the sermons week in and week out. He made a decision to allow the word of the Lord to take root in his heart. So much so that in spite of the direction of his leader, he decided that it was prudent to maintain hospitality at all costs. That regardless of what is being said over the pulpit, that everyone is entitled to receive the hospitality of our Lord. After all, every time we are hospitable towards someone, every time we care for someone, every time we extend our hand of help, every time we love on someone, we are truly exemplifying the love of God. So Demetrius took this to heart. Demetrius could not sit idle and not show respect and honor to those who are in the household of faith. Recognizing that we have extended family. We might be the Darksville family, but there are others out there who bear the name of Jesus that we must, at all costs, show love, show hospitality. The letter states that the actions of Demetrius preceded him. While these things that he was doing at his local assembly, uh, his, the reputation of such, it went far beyond the borders of his hometown. And so Demetrius, who at the risk of being put out the church for doing what's right, elected that in his heart the right thing to do, the righteous thing to do, 
is to always exemplify the love of Christ to not only the saved, but to the unsaved. Demetrius was willing to risk his standing in the church in order that he may justifiably show Christ to everyone. Whenever guests would come, those who may have been rejected by Diotrephes, he made sure that they were taken care of. He made sure that they had a place to, to lay their head and, and, and they were treated with the utmost in hospitality and respect. Not to be defiant to Diotrephes, but greater to be obedient to God. He was anointed to lead, just as all of us are. Leadership is not because we have a title of pastor or any other title before our name. We were born to lead. We were created to lead. The Bible shares with us in the book of Genesis that God gave man dominion over all the earth. So we were, in fact, created to lead before it was instilled in us to follow. Truth of the matter is, you cannot lead unless you learn how to follow. However, you were born to lead. What does that mean? All of us have a contribution to make to the household of faith. All of us have a contribution to make in our communities. Watch this. And, and, and you don't have to respond. I would like you to, but you don't have to, right? But watch this. How often have you sat in church and thought about ways of improving the church, improving our worship, improving how we serve one another and how we serve God and how we serve the community? How often have you thought of how we can improve in different areas around the church? That's leadership. So when I said earlier, we need your two cents. We need your input. I wasn't referring to your money. Give us that too, but I was referring to your input. We need your input because your input brings value to the table. You're able to consider things or activities or direction that just maybe we may overlook. Because maybe we might be in a, in a different place mentally, in a different place with vision. So we are charged to write the vision down and make it plain so that others may read it and run with it. See, we have to be careful that as we teach you, you very well might take hold to the teaching and run with it like Demetrius did. Because once you've learned something, it cannot be unlearned. Once you receive it, it cannot be taken back. Demetrius understood the need and the greater call to be obedient to God. He wasn't trying to be a leader. He was only doing what he was taught to do. He was doing what was righteous. He was doing what was acceptable to God. He was determined to ensure that a stain does not come against the church because of the actions of one. No matter what happens when you leave here, I want to make sure that you have the right experience. The experience that, that comes from those who love God and who love God's people. Demetrius understood that whether I get put out the church or not, you can't take me out of the kingdom. I may not be welcome in the building, 
but I'm going to continue to serve the Lord with gladness. His actions, his actions were so strong and so powerful that those who didn't even live in his community heard of what he has done and commended him on being steadfast in his faith and his commitment to God and to the church. His input brought value to the table. So I admonish you, we have two distinctive leaders in our text. One who is arrogant in nature, who believed that it was all about him and that the world evolves around him. And yet another, in all humility, chose to do what was right in the sight of God, regardless of the potential outcome for himself. It's not a sacrifice. See, a sacrifice is giving up something you hold so dear and true. But for us who are children of God, who have been redeemed of the Lord, washed in the blood of the Lamb, is no longer a sacrifice. It's our life. See, my life doesn't belong to me. I'm not sacrificing anything. I've all, the price has already been paid. So I give my life to it because I owe him that. My life is no longer my own. It doesn't belong to me. So if God chooses to use me in this way, in that way, then that's God's choosing. I am merely a tool in the hand of the master waiting to be used. See, I don't look at serving the Lord as a sacrifice. I'm not. I gave up the only thing I had to offer, and that was me. Now that I've given him me, I have nothing else but to just do what he wants. Diotrephes didn't wait for, uh, 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 Demetrius didn't wait for someone to encourage him and prime him and provoke him. He just did. Because it was needed to be done. How often have you prayed for someone, even if they didn't ask, simply because you saw they needed it? How often have you filled the need for someone, not because they asked, but because you noticed they had need? How many times have you said a kind word to someone because you recognized they needed encouragement, though they didn't ask for your input? You see, a leader is willing to put on display the character of Christ even when it's unprovoked. And the purpose of that is to then draw out the best from the person they're serving, that they too may arrive at a certain place of meeting their potential. That's leadership. We lead every day. We make decisions every day not just for ourselves, but for others, whether it just be for our spouse or our children or a complete stranger. Every day, we're showing hospitality. Every day. Do you realize that when you come into church and you just smile at some people, how they just smile back? It never crosses your mind that how much that smile has made a difference in what that person was dealing with in that moment. You just do it because, like leadership, it's just natural. It's just natural. So I ask you, what kind of leader are you going to be? Are you going to be diatrophies? 
one who was hubris in his actions, who chose to make it all about him, that brings no honor to God or to the household of faith? Or are you going to be Demetrius? It's, it's a natural reaction. It's in you to do what's right, regardless of the cost. Because you know that the greatest debt was already paid. So to us, there is no cost to do what's right in the sight of God. I conclude by telling you, you are anointed to lead. The Holy Spirit is upon you to lead and to do. To be the righteousness of Christ in the earth. You are anointed to lead no matter what state of life you're in. Young or not so young, you're still anointed to lead. The question is, are you going to lead? Especially in a season where we need leaders to step up. Look around. Today is the first Sunday that I've been here that we've had this number of people. Far different from last week. Is it because you love the Lord? <laughs> I was going to make a joke. I'm not going to say that one. It is because you love the Lord. So now the question is, how are we going to lead in the world where so many people are frightened and afraid? There's greater fear in their heart than there is faith. They're more concerned about Corona than they are about Christ. They have a greater hesitancy about weather than they do about witnessing. This is the time that God speaks to us. And, it's a and he's asking that us as leaders, we step up. We take charge. We say to the devil, enough is enough. We say to our church and to our community, it's time for us to hold up the bloodstained banner of Christ and keep marching forward. We are not going to take this laying down any longer. God bless you.